Hi, I'm your host, Swapnil Bharatiya, and welcome to Let's Talk. In today's show, we are going to talk about access pattern-driven development and how your teams can shift their focus from building back and crud to something that provides value to their customers and, of course, friends and teams. To discuss this topic, we have with us Randall Hunt, Director of Developer Relations at Vendia. Randall, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. If I ask you, how would you define product-driven development, what is it and how different it is from regular development? Well, when I think about product-driven development and access pattern-driven development, they go hand in hand. Uh, what you really want to unblock when you're a development team or a product leader is you want to unblock that product-driven development. You know, technology should not get in the way of what you're trying to do. And, you know, maybe that means you use old and boring software stacks that you're familiar with, that your team is familiar with, as long as you can move quickly and iterate on the product, you're doing fine. That's product-driven development. But one of the patterns that's evolving and becoming more prevalent in the industry right now is access pattern-driven development, which is when you, you know, if you think about physics and you think about launching rockets or any of this other stuff, you know, you have to break everything down into first principles. So how do you break an application down into first principles? You talk about the access patterns. What's the minimum number of round trip network requests that I need in order to serve relevant information to the users of my application? And if you think about those access patterns, if you think about you know, wh what all goes into it, you can go and break down incredibly complex applications, you know, ones that maybe talk to a million different data entities, and you can break it down into simple access patterns and you can compose those and build out uh, a very strong data model and a very strong product from first principles. So if I am not wrong, access pattern more or less flips the table and instead of looking at application from developer's perspective, you're looking from user and consumption perspective. Yes. So it, it's really putting the users of your application in charge and saying, hey, what are the common operations they're doing? What are the ways they're using the data that our application exposes? And then go to town, figure out how you can optimize each one of those access patterns and unblock as much undifferentiated work for the customers. Yeah, and some of the most iconic products in the history also, if you look at it, Steve Jobs and Apple is a very good example. Brown is a very good example, where the products are not created from engineers in the center. They are created around users in center and the product was created around them. So thanks for explaining that approach. Uh, now, if we just go back to the software or just narrow down to the cloud native or even further narrowed on to the Kubernetes community. And how do you see people, folks are uh, approaching de development, how they are either doing it right or wrong? What are they missing from your perspective or from access-driven development perspective? I think there's a, a lot that's missing right now, to be honest. There's uh, a tremendous focus on you know Kubernetes and setting up your infrastructure. And that's a very deep rabbit hole. And a lot of times startups, they will spend a tremendous amount of time on their core infrastructure, their backend, their DevOps, their CI and their CD. And what they really need to be focusing on is the product because that backend infrastructure, if we are all honest about it, it's mostly undifferentiated heavy lifting. It is, you know, I'm, I'm building yet another CRUD app, you know, maybe I've got a Rails stack and I'm throwing, uh, you know, Nginx along with it or or, you know, I've got a Flask app and I, or, you know, I've got a Postgres database and I'm throwing Postgres in front of it. That work is going to be the same for the base set of operations. And it doesn't make sense to keep focusing and iterating on that work when it doesn't add any value to your product. Your, your users don't care how things are implemented or on that back end. Your users care about what value you're providing to them through your product. So... Again, it goes back to that access pattern driven development. Like how are your users using your product? What are you doing to provide value for that pattern in the fastest possible way? And once you reach a certain scale, yeah, it makes sense. You got to go, you got to check out your Kubernetes setup. You have to figure out how you can optimize things, save some money on your cloud cost, all of that good stuff. But that's so much later than a lot of people start. You know, if it's, if it costs me a hundred grand a month to run my business in the cloud. And I know that if I spent, you know, six engineering months, I could get that cost down to like, you know, 10 grand, that's great. But in, in this market, when VC money is, is prevalent and, you know, there, there are all these opportunities to go out and build, you need to be building. You don't need to be 
focusing so much on iterating on your backend infra, you know? Yeah, sometimes uh, a lot of these projects and products, they become more about tech marvel than about actually serving a user in most cases. Yeah. What are the areas, what are the types of industries or projects it makes sense and where it doesn't make sense? I think that access pattern driven development and kind of a focus on the user is the primary way you should be developing applications in, in you know, 2021. There are exceptions, of course. You know, the, there, there are certain industries where this kind of top-down approach has to be done, a requirements, a specification. If you're building spacecraft or you're building, you know, um, life support systems, things like that, then that slower kind of top-down spec-driven approach is likely going to serve your needs better. And it also provides this kind of auditable chain of work uh, that you can go back on and verify and share with partners and things like that. So there, there's certain industries where you, you might still hold off on that full access pattern, like let's move quickly kind of deal. But the gross majority of consumer apps and even developer facing apps can be supported by access driven development. So we have been talking more about processes. Let's just talk about, you know, the tools and technologies as well. Um, uh, there's a big debate going on about REST, you know, everybody talks about that. But uh, if I ask you, what do you prefer? You prefer GraphQL or REST and, and what, why? I prefer GraphQL. Uh, so, I mean, I've been involved with APIs back to, you know, SOAP and XML and, you know, even remote procedure calls across, you know, cluster computing interfaces in NASA. Like, so I've seen it all. I've seen the gamut, you know, from... from from the worst to, to the best, you know, the, in the beginning, you know, we had these monoliths, you would split those, break them up into, you know, microservices, service oriented architecture, and maybe you'd start out, you'd send things over SOAP. So it's like XML and, you know, Perl or something in the back end. Uh, and then we started transitioning into these Ajax apps. So this is when JSON became prevalent and it became the primary method by which you would transport things between dynamic websites. So, You'd have your front end, it'd go, it would make an Ajax request, it'd get some JSON back. And that was really when REST kind of took hold of everything because you were able to take these different HTTP verbs and you were able to put payloads in them and you could build a lot of content around that. But the problem was HTTP1 still only allowed you to make like one request in one round trip network. So HTTP3 and, and other protocols, they, they have a little bit more uh, cool stuff going on to make you be able to do more in a single network request. But GraphQL was designed to say, hey, I know everything that I need to render this component. So when you talk about access pattern driven development, I know everything I need to show this user. You know, if I'm Spotify, I know what this page is going to be. I can put it all in one GraphQL request and I can get back all the data. And I don't care what the back end is doing, right? As long as I get back the data from my user, what the back end is doing to me as a front end engineer doesn't matter. And that power is really, it, it allows you to build applications that can um, adjust dynamically. You separate the, the concern between the front end developer and the back end developer. So the, the front end developer says, oh, I just need this field. Cool. I'm just going to add it into my GraphQL query. And now it comes back. Uh, and, and, you know, as back end developers, we have to go back and make sure those queries, whatever is happening on the back end, that it's optimized, that it's going to be served well and correctly. But it's still pretty cool to be able to just add a new field. I don't have to learn a new API. I don't have to learn a new thing. It's just all fully explorable and introspectable. So that's why GraphQL is, is probably what I would prefer. And that's where I see most APIs going in the future. Right. And also, you kind of touched upon it a little bit of that, but uh, uh, if you go back to access pattern driven development, how does this choice of GraphQL also kind of complement, you know, your approach towards how to do development right? Yeah, so with GraphQL, you'll have uh, an easy, there's this Apollo client, for example, is a, is a great way from the front end to go and or even the back end, if you want to go and interact with GraphQL based applications, you essentially give it an endpoint and then you can go and figure everything else out. And let's say you're using TypeScript, for example. Rather than you having to go and uh, introspect and learn the whole API and have maybe an SDK built on top of the API or some data object model built on top of the API, you just have GraphQL. And then everything can be determined from 
the, the queries that you're making or from the introspection into the schema that you're making. So if you're a front end dev and you get given a REST API, you, you now have multiple endpoints that you're having to track. You have to make a pseudo SDK that's going to go and talk to each one of these things. You have to fire the request separately. You have to manage all of that complexity within your front end application. With GraphQL, with React, for example, I plug it in. I say, hey, subscribe to changes on this. And then anytime I get a new request, uh, I, I just update the UI. So it really, really allows for you to go full speed with that access pattern driven development. It's like, whatever information I need, I know I can get it from this API. So I'm just going to add that to my query. No, I want to just quickly, uh, you know, change gear and, and, and um, move away from development to, you know, once you have built your replication and let's talk about, you know, we talk about site reliability, we talk about high availability. Uh, can you also talk about the importance of high availability uh, or multi-region, especially from the perspective of early stage companies, because creating a cool app is fun, but uh, having access to that app all the time and its perspective of where users are even more important. So talk about some of those factors, because sometimes earliest companies don't even focus on those things, but over a period of time, it becomes critical. Yes. So to be honest, that's one of the core reasons that we built Vindia is we realized that this multi-region architecture, it shouldn't be something that is left to the Fortune 500 companies who have uh, you know, millions of dollars to throw at either Kubernetes or, or, or Azure, AWS, or GCP. You know, they can just spend all this money and time building this multi-region application architecture. And I do think it's important to get it right early on. So you know, if, you, if you're a developer facing application and your control plane only exists in you know, one region and that region goes down, regardless of what cloud it's on, if you're serving end customer, you know, if you're serving developers who are in turn serving end customers, your support workload is multiplied, right? All the end customers are complaining to the developers and all the developers are complaining to you. So if it's a developer facing application, that multi-region architecture is really important. As a consumer facing application, your customers don't care at all about multi-region or anything like this. The only thing they care about is, is it fast? Is it working well? Is it performant? So if you can go and you can say, hey, uh, I'm going to serve my customers in Australia from you know, this region or this edge location, there you go. You're, you're all set. You've, you've uh, solved the fast problem for them. And that's one of the things that we try to do with Vindia is we, we want to make it so adding a new region, adding a new node essentially is one change in a JSON schema file or, or one change in a, a, a what we call uni registration file. And then you have a multi-reader, multi-writer, you know, set of your data available via GraphQL. And I remember, I, I mean, I, I've been in the cloud for a long time. I remember the early days of setting up multi-region architectures and, you know, doing DNS and doing geolocation DNS and, and load balancers and multiple stages of load balancers. Um, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, <laughs> it's the same every time, but it's so much work to get right. So it's a lot easier to just kind of pawn it off on somebody else and say, "Hey, run this for me." If you have any playbook, or uh, if you can share a few steps, how you know early stage uh, companies, it's more or less like to summarize what you have said uh, should approach development, not just from the the first line of code that they write to all the way here. You know, where we talked about availability all across the regions, right? I'd start with user stories. So I, I always try to go, who are the end users of my application? What are their motivations? And then how am I going to allow them to build and do the things that they want with my product? And if you iterate backwards from that, you know, Amazon is famous for their working backwards approach. It works, you know? If you, if you iterate continuously backwards from what the customer is trying to do and what they can currently do, you're you're set. And then from there, if you, as an early stage startup, uh, anything you can get as a platform as a service or a backend as a service, anything that's just kind of removing that undifferentiated heavy lifting, grab that, go for it. You know, the companies like Pinterest and Airbnb, you know, they were able to scale significantly because they went out and they said, I can just use AWS and I'll be all set. So if you find a way of removing something that you know is undifferentiated heavy lifting as a developer, as a founder, do that. 
it's it's worth the time it's worth the effort to focus on your product instead of focusing on you know this this undifferentiated heavy lifting of back-end infrastructure and i know i keep saying that and i keep repeating it but it's it's true Randall, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about access pattern driven development why companies should do that I mean, it looks like in most cases, it does make sense. You did share some use cases where it may not be applicable, regulated industry and stuff like that. But this is how uh, we should be approaching it. So thanks for sharing all those insights and also sharing those steps that how to approach it was really uh, icing on the cake. Thank you for your insight. And I'd love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you have a great rest of your week.